Hello folks, welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for joining me once again. You are always most welcome. Well, today you'll notice I'm dressed a little bit differently. I look like I've just come out of an important business meeting in the Managing Director's uh, boardroom. <clears throat> no, that, no, no, that's not the reason I'm dressed like this. If you look a little bit closer, uh, you'll notice that I have a tie on, which is uh, something I've only done like, once before on YouTube. This is the coronation tie with the King's coronation. If I zoom you in a bit more, you might if I get the zoom to work, you will see I've got little Union Jacks on my tie and crowns. And on the other side, Union Jack. Yes, there you go. Now, don't want to offend anybody. Uh, I, I'm not the biggest royalist in the world, but I, I quite like, yeah, I, I won't get into my personal views, but yes, I'm a bit of a royalist, but not the biggest. But uh, this is a very rare thing in the history of the nation, it only comes along every so often, you know. Some people, it's almost missed a generation because the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth lived so long. So it's not that common, you know. Uh, now I have to warn you, American friends, our good friends over in the States, across the pond, I've removed the American flag. Don't be offended, it's very temporary this. In fact, not only will the stars and bars be returning after I've done the Dan Busters and Coronation shows, there'll be more flags. I'm going to bring America back strong, our greatest ally. We'll be sitting down the American flag again in its usual spot next to the Union flag, but not, not just not for these two shows. But when it comes back, I'm also going to bring in, probably going to have the German flag, we're probably going to have Dutch flag. Um, what else did we have? Uh, I've got some flags on order uh, of, of the sort of majority of my subscribers. Um, and yeah, we've got, I think we've got French, German, uh, Italian, uh, Swedish, uh, uh, I think Norway and so on. Anyway, it's, it's, it's to represent quite a lot of the subscribers. Uh, you may not be able to see them all because they'll be, they'll be literally between each lamp on the desk. We've only got nine, so that gives ten flag spaces. I don't know if I've got ten, I think there may be six or seven. Anyway, just want to say I'm being very inclusive. But today, this is Britain's day, Britain's weekend. So actually, you, you're going to see this later, I think, after the coronation is actually over. But just wanted to, to make a bit of a, a statement here. Also, especially for the coronation, I'm wearing my... Uh, British-themed, Royal Navy-themed, James Bond, Commander's Watch. And, you may have already noticed, I have a new jacket. Now, this is not replacing the other one. Again, it's a special. This is actually an identical jacket. <laughs> Literally identical to the other one, but it's a different colour. This is called Tobacco. And it's like this sort of mauve shall we call it, really? It's like a mauve sort of colour. quite like it. Like a mousy, mauve I'd just like to be something nice and different. And before we get into the main thrust today, now this is going to be about the Dam Busters, but I'm not doing the Dam Busters historic talk today. I'm going to have a bit more, more of a light-hearted sort of atmosphere today. <clears throat> I thought it'd be nice for the coronation weekend to do something a bit more relaxed. So, a little bit tongue-in-cheek today, but we're going to have a look at the <clears throat> review of the Tamiya, the Grand Slam and Dam Buster, the B1, B3 Lancaster in 48 scale. Not the latest kit, but it's been reissued by Tamiya, so it should be quite nice. And we're going to talk about some alcohol. I'm going to have a drink today to toast our new king. And I had a choice, or did I? I'll show you what we got today for your amusement, if nothing else. So we've got Coronation Ale. You can get this from Jay Sainsbury's, amongst other places. And it's really, uh, I can recommend it. I've already had some of it. It's really rather nice. Um, unfortunately, uh, we haven't got many, many of these, so I've been barred from actually drinking that one without my wife, who's not here at the moment. Um, so that one's recommended for you for the coronation weekend, or in fact, any time. I'm sure you'll be able to pick them up cheap next week. Uh, very nice beer, that one. Uh, by the way, you'll ask who it's from. Um, an ale fit for a king, brewed in the heart of Dorset. Does it say who the brewery is? Bum, 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 bum. No, they're not. It is Sainsbury's. They're not going to say who it is. So I'm sure the experts amongst you in that part of the world will know. Then we've got the proper drink for a king. Look at this. This is the classic. Very British. Look at this. This is Nye Timber. And this is a beautiful sparkling wine made in England. Oh my lord. Look at this. So. Uh, perfect, um, what's it say? Designation of origin method by Knight in the West, West, West Chillington. Crown produced, it says. 
And are these guys by Royal Appointment? Classic cuvee. Over 30 years, Nye Timber has been single aim to make the finest English sparkling wines and the, to rival the very best in the world. And this, I can tell you. Uh, Nye Timber, Nye Mother King. Hmm, Nye Timber. Anyway, uh, uh, this was very highly recommended. Just one problem with it. It's the same story. Just about to pop this and have some bubbly and have some fun for a change. Uh, but my wife said no because again she's not here and she says if I open this, well that's it, divorce. So uh, and it's actually lovely and cold, absolutely freezing. Anyway, so what am I going to drink? That's a bit sad, really. I'm, <laughs> I'm down to the old little girl's drink from the 1980s. <laughs> Pierce Porter. But I do like this, it's very refreshing, it's light, don't get too tiddly with it, and, you know, it's quite refreshing, and it's quite light, and it's, you know, if you're trying to do a model review and be sensible, well, partly sensible, then frankly, you can't go wrong. But it doesn't fill you with any confidence when you see the cap, it's like a lemonade cap. <laughs> oh, there we go, it didn't even fizz, okay, well, it's, not, it's not bubbly anyway, but I'm going to pour myself some of that. I just suffer, really. Got a nice glass, though. <coughs> Excuse me. So we'll pop that down out of the way so we don't have any accidents. And I've got I'm all prepared today, so I've got myself, you know, wet wipes and I've got tissue and so we don't have any problems transferring anything onto the model. Obviously I'm wearing my gloves. Uh, now I have actually opened the box of this model, I had to, because as you probably remember most of you, Tamiya have this awful habit, which really drives me bonkers, I hate it, where they have staples on the bags. And so, you know, if you don't pre-prepare by removing the staples, you're sitting here in a review, you could either slice it open, obviously, but that ruins the bag. Or you just have to pre-prepare it by removing the staples. So I've literally removed the staples, I haven't opened the bags, I've just got rid of the darn staples, which is such a nuisance. So we'll be able to get into it fairly quickly. So, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the dam busters, I'll, I'll mention one or two things relating to it. But I want to do that, I, I was going to do one big show of the Down Busters, but I decided to do it into two shows. One with the model review, that's this one. And the other one will be more of a historic talk. I'll have the model with me in the background and, and I'm going to talk through a book as well. I relate, obviously, to the Down Busters movie and other things. Anyway, to the King, King Charles. Cheers. Long may he reign. Yeah, long live the King. God save the King. Mmm, it's actually quite nice. It's actually quite nice. It's very quite sweet and light. So, for those of you that don't know, the Tamiya kit came out in first came out in ninety four. Was it? Yeah, I didn't do my research today. It came out a while ago. It's got at least twenty five years old. In it says twenty twelve on the side of the box. <coughs> so this is box number kit number one one one. 48111, they also call it uh, item number, oh, it's confusing, sorry, I'll start again, it's 61111 for some reason. Now what is interesting, I'm going to show you, <coughs> show you the goods, and it comes with some figures, and it's got one or two interesting things about this actually, it's um, it's not the latest tooling, but look at this one, this is one where the, um, the Grand Slam version, where it's got uh, the, you can see that the front turret, gun turret is removed, to save a bit of weight, and then you've got this uh, fairing for the Grand Slam bomb underneath. £22,000 bomb. Whew. And this, of course, is what they uh, they sunk the turpits with. Uh, and, uh, of course, they also use them on uh, the various bunkers and the v V1 and V2 sites in places like Epilec in northern France. On the other side, we have got, still this time, we've got gone back to the conventional front gun turret, but of course this is the upkeep mine, uh, with its bouncing bomb that will bounce on the water, it spins of course, um, and it, it's, it's heavily modified, it, heavily modified, it's got aerodynamics, it's got the lighting system that enables them to, to judge what height they're at and know when to drop the bomb, and then it's got this rather interesting uh, unusual thing where we've got the uh, this particular kit comes with the pre-painted clear pass. They do pre-painted sprue and an, and an unpainted conventional sprue, so you've got a choice of either, which makes it quite interesting. Gives you some options. 
you could do you know a bit of a mix and match really and uh, if you felt it wasn't good enough you could maybe uh, use some of the smaller uh, the turret parts you know that are pre-painted and then maybe for the glass house the main canopy you could do your own thing mask it it could save you some time now <coughs> um I, I just a quick word about the downbusters movie i say i'll get into that more in the other video i'm going to shoot but <coughs> excuse me i've got a bit of uh, summer asthma by the way hay fever uh, asthma and i'm coughing nothing to do with the other cough i had not the same at all i've just got a bit of a splutter this occasionally comes up i'm allergic to tree pollen it's the right the time of year now where the tree pollen comes out and causes problems and i was out quite red in the face and it's not because i've been drinking i've been out gardening for about three hours and it was really hot and then the minute i finished the garden i was quite lucky it absolutely has hurled it down with rain you can hear the birds outside you'll also probably hear rain showers because it's been quite heavy rain anyway i'm just going to say in the Dan Busters movie, the one thing that's a little bit... Well, there's two things that irritate you about the film. Um, the original film I'm talking about, which is a masterpiece. Uh, and please don't think that I'm criticising it overall. I think it's a wonderful film. But the two things that irritate you, of course, are the special effects where they have the explosion and the, uh, the water, which is not done well. And the other thing is that um, something they couldn't do anything about was that in the original movie, uh, the bomb was still classified under the official secret act. So they have this sort of a big just like a fairing and no sign of the actual bomb itself and uh, you don't actually see it on the Lancasters at all because the uh, the MOD wouldn't allow them to show them so it's a bit of a slightly compromised it in terms of accuracy which is such a shame because in so many areas that film is so well done the acting from uh, Sir Michael Redgrave and Richard Todd is just stellar really you won't find a more <coughs> engaging and accurate sort of a telling of a story than that one uh, it's just the, some of the visual and technical details that went a bit wrong anyway enough of that let's get into this kit and have a proper look at it and i say i have i have to literally just take the top off and then just remove staples from the bags that's all i've done so it comes with a nice box of lovely artwork which you could easily well yeah i was gonna say you could easily cut it out and frame it, it would have been better if they'd have put this data above that picture but anyway the artwork is what it is there we go now, say, it's an older tooling kit. We're not going to have sort of uh, oil canning effects and stressed skin effects, unfortunately. But, I paid for this. It was on, it was on offer at um, was it the Nantwich Model Show and I bought it there. I saw several that were a bit, a bit rough. This was mint, brand new. And it was on offer at... <coughs> excuse me. It was on offer at 90, I think it was 99 pounds, and I said, no, it's too much. And the guy said, give me 85, and I said, done. <laughs> and I thought, that's quite a good bargain, actually. No complaints there. So let's see what we've got then. Move that out of the way over there. I'll move all my alcohol out of the way. Somebody did say to me recently, you've seen uh, the wing that wings, the ghost of bombers I've been doing. No alcohol, he needs to be on the A game for that, you know. But somebody was joking in one of the other ones where I was in the Shakespeare and the alcohol, and he said, Is this a modelling channel or an alcohol channel? I said, It's, it's a modelling channel, and alcohol just there for a bit of fun. I said, I, If you actually watch what I drink in these shows, it's, it's usually not more than a glass, if that. And, and he wrote back and said, Right, yes, yes, it's a modelling show with a, with a touch of a four ye go. <laughs> I thought it was quite funny. Anyway. Top tips, I don't even need that. Move that aside. I'll have a little drink while I'm thinking about alcohol because I'll need it. Now, obviously, we're celebrating the 80 years of the anniversary of the Dambusters raids, Operation Chastise. And we start off. Ooh, look at this. Oh, this is good. Now, Tamiyar did, have always done this quite well. I'm not quite wing at wing stand, they Kasari. But they are quite good with their support literature. So what have we got? We've got, in English, <coughs> both languages, I think we've got Japanese as well, and some French. Um, so we've got the, basically the lay layout of the bomber. Uh, shows the, uh, in this case, it's actually showing the, uh, the downbuster version. Spotlight for judging altitude, it shows that. The ventral machine gun underneath. They didn't know about actually, okay. The upkeep mine. And then the front spotlight for judging altitude. So they set the shine the two spotlights, of course. And when they converge, I think they were at, was it 60 feet? 
and tells you all about it in detail here. So it's got a moonlight attack. <coughs> and it says, uh, bum, bum, bum. During the World War II, the Ruhr region, the basis of Germany, Germany's heavy industry and was an important target of the RAF. Destruction of the area's hydroelectric dams in particular would cut power to the factories and reduce Germany's production capacity. But of course they are well defended by anti-aircraft guns, as well as torpedo nets placed in the reservoirs themselves. Barnes Wallace, an engineer at Vickers Armstrong in Britain who researched bomb design, initially proposed dropping a 10-ton earthquake bomb on the dam from high altitude. But the aircraft which would carry such bombs did not exist at the time. <coughs> 10 tons. Cool. Blimey. Wallace then proposed the bomb that would skip across the surface of the water over the torpedo nets and sink next to the dam wall, then detonate the bre and, and breach the dam by the force of the explosive shock waves against the wall. Experiments demonstrated the validity of the concept and, and arrangements were made to conduct a daring low-level attack in May 1943 against the dams. On the night of May the 16th, Wing Commander Guy Gibson led the dam busters uh, of Lancaster No. 617 Squadron, later known as the Dambusters, towards the Germany under the light of a full moon. This force of 19 specially modified bombers was divided into three groups. Gibson led nine planes to attack the Mona and the Ada Dams, and the second group with five planes to attack the Sorper Dam. And the third group with five planes was the reserve. The most difficult ta task was the bombing run since the special bombs had to be released at a very precise altitude and speed. Oh, you know, it shows you here, look. Bomb, spun, bomb is spun at high speed, then released, skips across the surface of the dam, then sinks next to the dam wall and explodes to set depth and shot waves breach at the set depth and the shot waves breach the dam wall. And of course, that's exactly what happened at the... Uh, at the uh, the first dam with um, with Gibson's attack, his squadron's attack, uh, and that was on the um, the Mona. <coughs> so they breached the Mona and the Ada, didn't they? Yes. Um, the bombs had to be released at altitude. Uh, it just it does go on for a while. Uh, and then this is I don't know. Right, I, I won't carry on reading that simply because we're going to get into this detail. I'm going to talk about that detail quite a lot. In the other video, I didn't realise it went on quite so long, I thought it was just like that one couple of paragraphs, but it's a bit longer. We'll get into that later. It's nice that they show you that diagram, that it gives you a bit of an idea, you know, graphically, of, of what it was all about. And then on the other side, it also shows the, the Grand Slam bomb, which is on that side for some reason. Picture of the Grand Slam bomb as the alternative. Very nice. Very, very nice to have some historical data, you know, to make it... More of an experience than these. I'm gonna, here we go. Rant alert. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. These Chinese kits, of course, that come with none of this. You're just left in the dark, really, and they don't even tell you what colours to paint. Some of the components inside the kit not good enough. Don't understand why we're all supporting them. I'll tell you now on this subject to get this rant out of the way. I saw the 135th scale new border. Uh, Fock Wolf 190, which looks really nice. And then about a week later, Zokimura announced that their Fock Wolf 190 was coming out in the 132 scale, and that, and I didn't I didn't get as far as actually making an order, because I was very reluctant with border. I don't want to be harsh to border. Their moulding is exquisite, actually, but they are just lazy, and they just can't be bothered to do these instructions. Uh, uh, historic stuff, no. The colour callouts, no. They even screwed it up and called it the Messerschmitt FW 190 on the colour callout sheet. I'm sorry, it's the same thing we had with the kinetic kit. I'm not going to go on about it again. I placed my order for the Zoki Mora and I have not ordered the border. I will not be reviewing the border kit. Can't be bothered if they can't be bothered. Why should anybody endorse them or promote the product? I'll promote the good one. So I'm sure I'll be doing a review on that. Uh, the Zokimura SWS FW190A4. It'll be the back end of the year, though, nearer Christmas, I think. That will be <coughs> the finest Fockwell 190 kit you've ever seen. I guarantee you. We move on. So, <coughs> we'll look at the day cards in a minute. Let's have a look at. Now, this is a bit more old school, so I warn you, I haven't opened it yet, so I don't know what's inside, but I, I, I say I did have it in 2012, so I'm sure it's pretty much the same. In 
I'm just wondering if it has a date on it here, actually, out of interest. Just, just worth looking at, isn't it, to see if it does say. Mm -hmm. Date anywhere? Give us a date? No, 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 they don't want to say. Anyway, it was basically printed in 2012, I'm sure, the original version. So, let's zoom in and have a look. Let's go. So, again, it shows that lovely artwork. This time it's in black and white. And... It's got quite a big wingspan, obviously, 148, so this competes really with the Hong Kong model uh, kit. Now, Hong Kong model, in fairness, they didn't do the um, stress skin effect either, I don't think, not on the 48th scale kit. So, this is about £20 cheaper, £20, £25, well, I paid £35 cheaper. So, this is quite competitive, so if you want a big Lancaster that's going to be decent, will build well, this is probably going to be something you should consider. Anyway, let's have a look. So, big wing span, obviously, 648 millimetres. You need a big cabinet for this one. Let's see what we've got. Offers three versions. So you've got two versions of the Dam Busters. So you've got <coughs> uh, G for George, which of course was Guy Gibson's plane, and Q for Queenie, was it? I can't remember now. Who's... who's after the, this is the research that will come up, I'll check that when we talk about the actual raids in my historical talk and presentation. And then you've got the uh, April 45, where they were, I think they, were, they bombed the, the dams in Holland uh, and, the, and the dams in Germany. Um, sorry, not the dams, the canals, I mean. There was a big, um, quite high attrition raid that was mounted by 617 Squadron. And sadly, quite a lot of the survivors from the Dam Busters were killed in this raid on the, on the canals, German canals. Anyway, here we go. So you've got three options, you've just got to decide whether you want A, B or C. And we'll take it from there. <coughs> right. We've got some figures. Now, again, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stop already. <laughs> and have another little rant. Um, yeah, you know, people don't tell me... Um, well, they give you figures, you know, they, they give you, they do this quite a lot, actually. Do it in the 30 second scale kits as well, you get figures. We're not getting that from Airfix, we're certainly not getting it from the Chinese guys. Zokimura do it, but only in the special editions. This has got a crew, basically, or most of a crew. Which is what you want, you know, you want to have a proper kit where you've got several different options and you can display it in different ways, you know, paint some figures up. And I think that people are just getting out of the habit. They're letting the manufacturers di dictate to us, you know, that, that, that nobody, no, we don't do figures anymore. Nobody wants figures. It's like dioramas with the, you know, the matchbox dioramas that I always talk about, where I don't see any reason why someone like Airfix or Ravel couldn't introduce some new ones. Absolutely none. They just can't be bothered, really. And they've gone about cost. Well, I'll tell you what. Small, you know, for youngsters, having a diorama would make that have twice the shelf appeal that the bug standard kits have got today. They're just boring. Even the Airfix ones are boring. Sorry. They don't get it. Anyway, I'm ranting. Back to the main. Yeah, get back to the day job. Quite. Sorry about that, folks. <clears throat> I'm going to put some more light up here as well. Boost the light a bit. There we go. How's that? So, we've got our lovely figures here. Um, we've got the crew, we've got radio operator, pilot, ground crew. Look at this, you've even got ground crew. There's no dog, sadly, no Labrador. Um, mm, 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 use, different, use a base when positioning the figure if necessary. So there's a, there's a base you can put it on as well. You see, they've, they've made an effort, haven't they? That's really good. Really good. Right, cockpit assembly, you're building up the um, pilot's uh, seat <coughs> and the navigator. Uh, and then there's differences in the cockpit between the two versions, um, which are what? I'm just trying to get my head around what the differences are. It's not that obvious in the in the diagram. Is it the spacing? Yeah, it's the spacing. So in the dam buster, they all sit together on one level, and and in the uh, grand slam, the navigator sits down. There's a, there's a step down. So that's the difference. When you've got your interior parts for your fuselage, and it's got fair detail, you know, you've got your radio operator's radio station, radio position here. That's quite good, isn't it? Like that. 
We've got the windows, sets of windows going in. It's more than Airfix gave you on the Concorde. Just saying. <laughs> and then you're putting all that in. <coughs> it's not overly detailed, as you can see. That goes in between the two uh, sides of the, uh, the fuselage. Then we've got the gun turrets going in. And again, now this I've got to I've got to say it again. I've got to draw your attention to this. Um, I bought a relative of mine the wonderful Hong Kong model version, but when I had a quick look at it, I was very frustrated by the instructions where it just said nothing, showed a gun turret and another gun turret, and you'll have to guess which was which. There was nothing to indicate which there were, there was no no wording, no words, yeah, no words in English. Tamiya make the effort, and this is exactly what you would expect. Not a guessing game, you know. Come on, guys, it's just not good enough. We've got to stop tolerating it and just stop buying them. Simple as that, really. They need to get the message, these people. Tell me I'll get it. Look at this. Professional, yeah? Cement. Do not cement. Tells you what the colours are. This is what you expect. from. That's what instructions are supposed to be. They're supposed to tell you what to do. Not, not show a picture of something and then let you guess how it's achieved. It's not, you know, Mystic Meg. Ridiculous. Anyway, enough of the run. So you've got here the rear gun turret. Front gun turret, clear, clear. And you've got the different types of uh, the bomb aimers front window glass. Which is quite interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> uh, various little bits of detailing going on here, putting your gun turrets in. It even shows like a photo, that's unusual actually for Tamiya. It shows an actual photograph of the completed parts, look. See that? That is good. Okay, so it shows you the relative positions of what it should look like. So you've got your bomb aimer in there as well. You can probably hear in the background, folks, it's chucking it down with rain again, by the way. <laughs> I think we're having a bit of a wet coronation. <clears throat> and we've got the canopy going on. You, obviously, you've got this choice of uh, whether you go for the, the painted canopy. Paint the canopy frame in the fuselage colour depending on your choice obviously. Front gun turret, pre-painted canopy, oops sorry, seemed out too much. Pre-painted canopy can also be used. There you go. So I think that, it, that that helps the younger modeler especially, you know, if you're not that confident it'll still look good, you know, it will. But for the more experienced modelers we probably want to put our own effects on it, you know, and perhaps a bit of weathering and stuff like that. Then you get into the motor nacelles. Um, it's a fairly straightforward uh, construction, I've got to say. You can see straight away it's not, it's not overly complicated. Two nacelles, a couple of intakes, and that's it. Then we've got the main, la whoops, main landing gear going on. <coughs> Excuse me. Main landing gear, and it's quite a beefy, meaty landing gear because they have these huge wheels and tyres down in the Lancaster left wing and then you assemble that all together, top and the bottom of the wing go together and then you put in your uh, weight on wheels as well which is good, weight on wheels, tyres so you've got flat, some flat section on the tyres and then you've got, you just repeat the process uh, and that's good as well, it doesn't show you just doing it all again you know it says left wing, right wing it's quite succinct and brief, it, it keeps it simple, it keeps it clear but it doesn't repeat itself too much and then we've got these little control arms that go on your ailerons going in uh, and also the lights going on the end of the wingtips. Then we've got our vertical uh, stabilizers, uh, tail fin assemblies they call it. And again you've got lots and lots of a um, uh, great deal of sort of you know, detail in terms of the elevator control arms which is nice. And the same for the rudders. <coughs> and then you bring it all together, it's quite a simple assembly to be honest. Tail wheel goes in, vertical um, the rear tail fins go on, and you've got this sort of an interlocking style of um, like a jig sort of assembly, uh, click click in the wings, and then we get to the real business end of the model. Then we're into the uh, the upkeep mine. Here we go. It's got the drive belt as you can see. It's got the mounting. Um, what do you call it? The uh, the mountain, the, the bearers, which actually hold the weight of it. 
Or, of course, if you want to go for the Grand Slam, you've got the Grand Slam option here. By the way, it sounds like I've not just got rain, but hail, it sounds like I've got behind me. In fact, it sounds like it's turned... I, I was out saying I've just got a lot of a very red face because I've been out doing the garden for three hours. It sounds like it's turned into winter out there. You hear it? That's heavy rain. That's heavy rain. <laughs> Not sure we're going to get our RAF fly past at the coronation, I'm afraid. Anyway, a um, few more. <coughs> You've got this ventral gun, which goes in here. Oops, in a bit more. Ventral gun, which is really good, which is quite interesting detail I've not seen before. <coughs> and then we've got the um, assembly without the engines. Um, that's what it looks like at this point. Then you've actually put the engines in yourself. And then it's showing you exactly how it should look. Left and right exhaust going in, quite straightforward. There's not a huge amount of detail here. <clears throat> and they are giving you the option to just, just not build the engines at all, or actually build them. So they do provide them early, and I think they're a bit rudimentary. Don't expect too much of the detail, to be honest. But, um, but there we go, and then you've got your propellers, I say it's not, it's not overly complicated, it's got the propellers going on, you've got your spinners going on, and you've got, I think it provides two engines, so you can have the, the cover over, off, that's one of the options, um, motor cover on, motor cover off, there you go in, and then that's it really, so that's, that's over to your, your painting, uh, paint call out at the end, all nice and clear, black underneath of course, in all the versions apart from the, uh, the April 1945 Grand Slam but the downbusters of course are all black underneath uh, and there we go and it just shows you the positions of the various decals call outs uh, and then we've got the stencils there aren't very many in fairness you see them over here not a lot not too excessive it's not a not a phantom you know so there we have it. So it's a little bit old school. It's a little bit uh, simplified. You know, it's more simple and less uh, less parts than uh, the Hong Kong models, got, of course. But there's a sort of beauty to that simplicity, I think, and it's it's priced it's priced sensibly. So I picked it for eighty five pounds, which is pretty cheap, I thought. Not at all bad. Let's have a look at what we got. Decals. Oh, okay. Well, wow, there really aren't many stencils. This is amazing, actually. Control one. Check this out. <coughs> hmm. Okay, so we've got very few stencils. We've got the instruments there for the instrument panel, of which there are many, and just a handful of stencils. Literally, not many at all. Over on the decals, we've got. The lovely big roundels, and again, uh, one or two of the stencils and uh, warning signs, but minimal really, very minimal. Nothing to it at all. So that seems straightforward, didn't it, to be honest? <coughs> right, we'll zoom you out. And we'll have a look at the parts, and we'll, unlike the wing that wings recent. Lost Ark finds we'll be opening the bags. That's why I removed all the staples. Don't I just spoil you? Well, sometimes I do. Okay. Come on, come on. There you go. Lovely. Right. Time for a drink. Coronation party, etc, etc. In fact, I need a few refill. And I've got no assistant to do it for me this time. Oh, slip, slip. Very nice. It does quite drinkable, doesn't it? If you like, if you just want something that's pleasant, light, refreshing, alcoholic drink, this is the one for you, really. You know, it's not gassy or anything, so it's quite quite sociable, really. <laughs> he says, and I've got the damp all over me now. Get that off. Not that transferring onto the kit at all. <laughs> Cheers. God save the king. Yes, it's um, it's not it's not every weekend you get a coronation. You know, last time was uh, 
what was it, 80, 80 years ago was it? 70 years ago, 71 years ago? 71 years ago I think it was, the last coronation, amazing. So, where should we start? Let's start with the fuselage, shall we? Let's move these over here out of the way. Let's see what we have. <coughs> Um, it's probably not going to be the finest detail on the surface, but I think it'll just go together like a dream. So I think you'll have a fairly straightforward film. And here we are. I like the way that they've got the actual parts taped together for you. Again, the Tamiya are very thoughtful in the way they present these things. So here we go. I'll tell you what we'll do. I know we've got the Union Jack loud and proud here. I think we might just uh, cover it up for a second. It might give us a little slightly better slightly better image of the camera. There we go. Don't have any distractions. We'll come back to the Union flag later, don't worry. So, they've gone and taped it for you just to hold it all together. Um, and it's got, all the panel detail is there. You can see it. It's all there. It's just not perhaps as graphic and as fine as it would be in a, you know, a tooling that's right bang up today and I say it's over 25 years old this one but that sound of that sounds like I just leaned on something that broke ouch sorry <coughs> that's one for eBay then no just joking folks it's fine um, yeah I mean it's a bit it's got the sort of shiny plastic a bit different to what Tamiya use now but it's it's a good hard plastic and you usually find that this actually goes together and glues extremely well just perhaps, you know, you might have a little bit of seam work. It doesn't look like it's the best finish on these seams here. So I think, yeah, that's going to need a little bit of work. But because it hasn't got such deeply engraved panel lines, it probably makes it easier if you need to rescribe them. Afterwards, it's probably going to make that fairly fairly straightforward, really. But, yeah, I quite like it, really. It's a, bit, it's a bit old school, as we said. This is probably its weakest part, this fuselage, I suspect. I think as we go through the rest of it, it'll probably seem relatively more impressive because, you know, today you would avoid all this. You'd have a set, the, the Tamiya do it already. They, they put a central section in to avoid a seam and all that kind of thing. So bear in mind, as I say, it is an old kit, but it's priced accordingly. And it's, other than that little bit of work, you might have a bit of clean up there. Apart from that, I think you'll find it will go together really well. I've not heard any great horror stories about this kit. So that's the first one, that is the fuselage. Then we have got the clear parts. And this is the conventional clear parts, let's call it, sprue. Oh, now then. Do you know what, they're rather nice, apart from the fact that's come off. Do you know, I think that part was off when I bought, bought one in 2012 as well. Now then, look at this. So this is the standard conventional Canopy. <coughs> Excuse me. It's got all the very finely, very finely engraved on the surface. The the, uh, the window frame markings. So you're going to need a really good mass set, aren't you, for this? But I have to say that the clarity is well up to the standard of Tamiya even today, clarity-wise. Um, not not much distortion. Don't be getting that. Not too much distortion. Crisp, nice and clear, nice and bright, quality plastic. And we've got our. This is the alternative um, sort of. Uh, this is the front instead of the. Uh, instead of the uh, nose turret, I think, isn't it, on the Grand Slam version. Then we've got our various turrets. So that's the nose turret, standard nose turret, clear glass. And then we've got the the optional different types of Bob Amos window right at the front on the chin. There, that one on that one. We've got the side windows here. Um, we have got some, yeah, we have got some flaws actually. Can you see them? Yeah, you can see them. There we go. Got some flaws in the side windows. Can you see that? Yes, yes, there they are. See that? That's a little bit disappointing. It's a little bit disappointing, a bit old school. You might polish out. Which side are they on? 
on the outside, on this side, as you're looking at it from the nearest side. Yeah, that's a slight disappointment. Then you get your rear gunner at the back. <coughs> so the, the big, the big ones are really nice, but you know the parts you'd expect them to get no problem at all. They've got flaws in them. It's a bit strange, isn't it? Didn't expect that. But all the all the shape stuff, the tricky stuff, is lovely. Without fault at all. And the flat planes of glass got sort of a, a mould mark in them. Then this is the optional parts. So this is where you've got the <coughs> different type of um, two different options for the front, as I mentioned. Uh, the bomb aimer's position. Wow, we've got thunder! I can't believe it. I thought we were having some strange weather. Thunder. Okay. <coughs> oh dear. Perhaps King Charles is not in favour with the gods. <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening there. Did you hear that? I wonder if we're going to get any more of it. Well, we'll stay on the air because it'll be atmospheric, won't it? With the jack busters. Anyway, so um, here we've got uh, that tail gunner's uh, position, and that's quite that's quite nicely done, isn't it? See, yeah, like that. And there's nothing wrong with those clip parts; they're beautiful, flawless, absolutely gorgeous. So that's those, and then of course we've got the optional pre-painted versions, which is not not everybody's cup of tea. Sorry, I should have just alluded to this one, the loose one. <coughs> Here we go. That's the loose rear rear gunner's position. I think we'll put that in with these, which is probably more sensible. Then, as out of the way, put them all together, I think. That's a good idea, isn't it? There we are. Now, here we have, get the focus. I notice that when I go to full zoom, it gets very, very hard to focus. So I'm just going to come back from full zoom a bit these days, try to do a bit less. And look at the way they've done this. I think this is really clever. So they've actually wrapped them and they sort of compartmentalised them all separately so they don't scratch against each other or get damaged. Can you see that? And they've kind of uh, heat shrinked between each one. And they've gone and gotten them in different colours depending on which part of the aircraft they're on or which optional scheme that they'll be used for. Isn't that good? That's cool! Now, I know some of you will say, oh, it's a bit toy-like. Yes, but they're giving you both options, aren't they? This is excellent, because if you've got a youngster, or, I mean, I've just had a chap, uh, I think he's fairly young, he's been asking my advice, I always sort of blanch and um, and blush a bit because I don't I don't profess to be the greatest uh, advice giver, but he's been asking me. He's been saying um, <coughs> his name's Andy, and he's been asking me, uh, saying that he lives at home with his parents and he can only do the models in his bedroom. And he's asking about airbrushes and things. And, and I think we've both agreed that it's probably best he doesn't go for an airbrush because he hasn't got anywhere to extract it to. Uh, and he's worried about the fact that his parents want that smell and all together. And he, he prefers to hand paint, and uh, and he's a classic example of one of these models. Now, when he when he sees this, he's going to think, "Wow, yes, that will save me hundreds of hours of pain and making it." I mean, that if you're not if you're not that experienced and you haven't got an airbrush, frankly, that's a no-brainer, isn't it? Because the quality and the sharpness of it is so good. What's not to like about that, really? You know, okay, if you're super advanced model, no, I appreciate that. But a lot of modellers who are returning to the hobby or newcomers, no, this is really a help, a real help for them. I think that's brilliant. I'd like to see more of that. I would like to see more of that. I don't know what made Tammy go for it on this particular kit. Do any of you know, it's even got the back look painted in the uh, camouflage green. That's great. Uh, I wonder why they did that. Do, do, does any of you know if they've done this? I won't open each one, you know, but you can clearly see that they've, they've basically pre-painted it for you. It's amazing. I love that. It's a really good innovation. But have they done this on other kits? Does anybody know? It's interesting. Give me a shout out and a comment on that. Here we've got more of it, you know. And dare I say, <laughs> this is quite funny. The quality of this clear, these flat panes is actually better than it was on the standard clear parts. How odd. I can't see any faults this time. Granted, I've got them in the bag. I know. Just actually kill that light a little bit, shall we? 
Put that off. There we go. There we are. That's a bit easier now. Then we come to the actual painted main glass house canopy, and it's. Let's put it in front of my white. Make it easy to see. There you go. My white, nice white shirt for the coronation. Look at that! I mean, that's brilliant. You know, this is one of the most difficult things for a newcomer or a less confident or less experienced model to achieve is to get get the clear parts right and get those frames. There's so much work, so much opportunity for it to go horribly wrong, yeah? I think it's remarkable that, to be honest. I'm going to cut this, I'm not going to get them all out, but I'm just going to get the main canopy out, because I think we should look at it a little bit closer. Let's have a look at this. Wow, tell you what, that is clever, look at that, coming closer now, again I'll get the old shirt behind so you can see it better, now then, look at that, now I, I think that has a place in the hobby, I really do, I think that's really quite, let's just put it from my shirt, see, now what's not to like about that, that's really quite, that's really very good. I'm almost tempted to use that myself, to be honest. <laughs> I really am. You can always do a little bit of clever weathering, you know, be very precise with it, sort of later, but, you know. And before, you know, I know there's a lot of expert modellers out there, <clears throat> but before we're too critical of it and we don't want to damn it too much, I've just got to remember that this this is a kit that will appeal, especially with the Dan Buster's anniversary, will appeal to a lot of people, so... I say that's really good from Tanya. I'll pop that back very carefully. I think I'll probably better immediately put some tape over that to protect it. We don't want it getting damaged in any way. A little Tamiya tape will do that for us. Like, oops, like so. Just get that folded over. I think that's a very, very good idea. They're catering for everyone, aren't they? They're catering for you, for me, inexperienced models, newcomers, etc. What is not to like about that? Why is that not? We we'll use that separately later. Right, that was clever, I think. That was a good idea. I think we should see more of it. I think it would be very inclusive to bring in, you know, the people that are struggling to achieve that sort of uh, more technical detail framework. We should embrace it. Anything that brings more people into modelling and more enjoyment for people has got to be a good thing. Some men! My man, Mr. Zorin. Sorry, I'm quoting from <coughs> A View to a Kill there. Where, um, Max Zorin, the evil maniac, uh, Bond villain, is, decides to machine gun all his men. And his former says, My man, Mr. Zorin, my man! that will be killed and he says yes very convenient nasty good job I'm not like that <clears throat> I look after my men now I have to say okay these are not the finest figures I've ever seen but I, but I don't care I'll forgive a little bit of that they're a little bit softly moulded especially around the hands can you see that those hands but I think we need to see figures I think we need to see a lot more figures this does look a bit old school though, I've got to say. If you look at a modern Tamiya figure, like in that, their armour kits, like in that Sheridan or the Achilles, the figures are absolutely the best I've ever seen at 135th. Astonishing, they're like resin quality now. These aren't, okay, here's, that's your bomb aimer. He's lying down. Looks like he's, looks like the rapture's coming, he's elevating to heaven, doesn't it? Anyway, come back down here. <laughs> Then we've got the ground crew, who's giving, giving the V sign. He is, isn't he? He's giving the V sign, which is quite amusing. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> but we shouldn't be too sniffy about it, you know. We don't get figures. They do look a bit, I don't know, a bit, <clears throat> a bit soft and a bit, a bit simplified, perhaps, in a way compared to what we're perhaps used to. 
But if you paint them up right, you can you can actually cover that up quite well, I think. So I don't think we should be too upset about that. It's nice to see some figures. We need more figures. I just realised that's a parachute there, that little piece. We need more figures and we need stands and dioramas. And I think that some of these big manufacturers, especially Airfix in the UK, they need to take this on board because I think it's something that most people do want. Oh, it's nearly coming off the spring. <coughs> so yeah, the seat uh, cushioning. Right, so let's get into this. So here we've got quite a lot of small parts, including the actuate a lot of actuator arms for the elevators, ailerons, and the rudders there. And then we've got the uh, the shrouding for the turret, the upper turret. We've got part of the well, it's like the upkeep mine here, the dam buster bomb. Got the cover for the upper turret there for the Dambuster aircraft. The back of the turrets here. And this is the fairing that goes around the, the front, uh, front gunner's turret. We've got the main tail wheel. Tail wheel, I should say. And as I said, these are all the, the cushions for the seats, various seats. And then you've got one of the seats here. And you've got the yoke, almost like a steering wheel here. And then you've actually got the guns here, guns. Now they're not slide moulded, as you can see, unfortunately. And as I say, this is the limitations of the moulding process as of 25 years ago. Still very nicely represented though. Uh, they do, they are smooth and they've got no uh, cooling vents in them. Just go and buy yourself some aftermarket. Metal turrets is the answer, I think. Um, I'm just trying to think in the manufacturers that does nice ones for these. Um, uh, mine's kind of a little bit blank. Is it the guys in the guys in Poland? Master model, master model. Yeah, I'm sure they do, and there'll be others as well. Okay, well that's that one. <clears throat> then we've got one here with a couple of sprues in. And here we have got, wow, yes, here we've got the full upkeep mine, which looks good with all its bolts on it. It looks really cool. Look at this. Okay. And then you've got the drive belt as well. Look at that. Two sides of the upkeep mine. Drive belt system for it. it makes it spin. And then you've got the fairing here. The actual fairing that goes underneath where it mounts. The whole assembly mounts and then here, so this is basically an upkeep sprue if you like, and here are the actual supports which actually uh, the mounts for the upkeep mine itself. That's very nice. Again, you know, the moulding's a little on the soft side, but the, the bolts are done nicely, they look really good. The upkeep mine looks great actually. It's a very simple thing anyway, I've actually stood and touched one, so I know, I know what it's like. <coughs> then you've got the alternative sprue if you want the Grand Slam bomb, you want to go after the turpits. And you've got that fairing that we talked about on the nose, it's an alternative. You've got the, mount, the mounts here for the bomb, or the clamps. And then again you've got this different different design underneath the fuselage fairing. So again, uh, just, the, uh, just the other option isn't it basically from the, from the jam buster to the grand slam. Nicely, again, uh, sorry, I've skipped over the bomb itself, that was a bit remiss of me wasn't it? Here's the bomb itself, again a little bit softly moulded. Well, It'll look fine you get it, when you get that painted up, you know, a little bit of weathering on it. I think you make it look absolutely gorgeous, to be honest. No problem at all. Then, doo -doo -doo, we've got a couple of big ones. Get into the bigger, bigger sprues now, so I'll zoom you out. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this weather, actually, is definitely making my cough and asthma worse. Always does, actually. Always does. Hmm. Especially when it's like this thundery weather, Oof, it always affects me. Right, look at this, so we've got the tail blades. Now these look nice, actually. These look good, check this out. You've got some lovely detail there where the actual uh, uh, hinges are for the elevators. There's not much wrong with that, is there? Let's just spin it around, see a bit better this way. There we go. That looks really good, doesn't it? And then you've got the underneath. And you've got some very fine, very fine riveting detail, which they've done actually really well. 
Don't worry about the floor and the plastic, that won't show, I don't think, when it's painted. It's just the plastic itself. <coughs> and then you've got the, the vertical tail fins here with the rudders. And the other one is there. And they're in one piece, so on the other side, again, you've got some nice riveting detail and you've got nice hinges. Yeah, it's really nice, to be honest, it's fine. It's just not as sharp as a modern a modern tooling would be. And then you get the nacelles for your engines. That's the first one. Then we've got a double spray, so I'll just show you one of them. It's one of it's got one of the bigger engine nacelles here. <coughs> and then you've got various parts, including your, your propellers and your spinners. Uh, and then you've got these covers, obviously, the ones that have got the built-in um, uh, flash eliminators for the exhaust. Shrouds. And you've also got some of the undercarriage components going on here. And then you've got this, this is where it does let itself down a little bit. These very rudimentary Merlin engines, which, yeah, uh, not great, are they, to be honest? Rudimentary is right. So you get two Merlin engines in total. You can display two if you wish. There's two of that spray, as I mentioned. We'll pop that back and then get that in the bag. With me one second, I'll do this and I'll leave you with the green screen, which I don't, I don't mean to do that. It's a, it's a legacy of trying to do several things at the same time. <coughs> Oops, sorry about that. But uh, yeah, I say one or two areas, it's a little bit soft, a little bit, yeah, a little bit basic, but I think if an experienced modeler, I mean a, a younger modeler or a returning modeler, I think would make a nice Lancaster out of this without too much problem at all. And a more experienced model I can really detail it up, you know. You could add, you know, get aftermarket engines and all sorts of things. Oh, here's the wings, they are huge. Look at this. Now again, it's not quite got the finesse, but it has the it has the you know it doesn't have the separate uh, ailerons, you can't position them or anything, which is a bit disappointing. But too too much soon. The detail is good though, you know, you can see that there's some very fine riveting. The panel lining's all there. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, we haven't got any canning effect, stretch skin, okay. But then you haven't got that on the Hong Kong model one either, not at this scale. So, not that different, and this is £35, which is about, it's about 33% cheaper, yeah? On the other side, underneath, sorry, zoom you out. On the underside, we've got... Again, some good detail though, all the riveting is there, all the panel lines are there, you can feel it. And I think when it, with a good paint job on it, you can accentuate them, you can get a wash on it, you can really make them pop. I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem at all to make it look really nice. Would like to have seen some eleva ailerons and elevators that you could actually pose. That, that for me is one of the disappointments, that and the engines probably. Um, but you know, and, it's, and obviously the way it's, um, I, I, I still like the way they've done the things like the screw, screw contact gate points. They've done that quite well in fairness, and I don't think that you're going to have too much clean up to do, which is always good. good. I like no clean up, you know what I mean? I'm lazy like that really. And then the last one, it's a twin one again, so I'll just look at one of them. And it's uh, basically the alternative propellers. There's two styles of propeller. And the wheels and tyres, which look really nice. These they've done very, very well, I think. Got the weight on wheels style to it. Really nice sort of appearance. Uh, got a real presence about it. It's got the marking in, in the tyres, the mould marks, lines in the tyres. And then you've got your exhaust for your engines, which I've done those in one piece. Yeah, I've done them in one piece. And then you've got these cowls basically that cover the, the milling engine. So <clears throat> there we have it. It's kind of what I expected really. Um, I, I kind of remember it now from 20, 2012 when I got my mine the first time I never sold it on eBay because I had this thing about well where am I going to put it and then I only had one cabinet so it's definitely a no-no. 
probably still going to be the same problem because I don't have any room uh, effectively that I can actually put it in right now. It's going to be a bit of a problem, however, a bit of a collector's piece really, aren't they? And uh, it's a decent kit, it's a nice kit, it's just of its, of its time, but it's not bad. It's not like some of these horrible old kits that are covered in flash or rubbish like that. This is a quality product, okay? no question whatsoever. So, what do I think in verdict then? You've got to, like everything, you've got to bear in mind its age and bear in mind its price. So today, as I say, I paid, not sure, I paid £85 for that. £85. That's only £10 more than the Kinetic Sea Harrier is. <laughs> well, no, which I'd buy, and it wouldn't be the Kinetic Sea Harrier, that's for sure. I think I got very good value from it. Um, I think you can argue it's probably an 8.5 to 9 out of 10. Uh, I think at £85 it's a 9 out of 10. It's a 9 out of 10. You've got some great history in there. It involves you in the sort of uh, uh, the story behind the, the aircraft. You've got the two versions. You know, which is nice, you've got the crew, you've got... They've kind of given you extra stuff that you say, oh, it's, it's, not, it's not as good as, you know, Hong Kong. Well, isn't it, though? At the price, I think it's just as good, if not better, for the money. I'm not saying it's a better kit overall. <clears throat> but for £85, you know, that's not bad. There's a big model. You've got the crew, you've got those painted canopies, which help the younger modeler. I'm going to give it 9 out of 10. You might say I'm being a bit generous, but actually I think there's a lot going for that. There's a lot of reasons why many people, if you want a Lancaster, a big Lancaster scale model, that's the one you'd go for if you don't, if you don't want to pay over £100. Yes, I'd recommend the Hong Kong model at that scale, probably above this. But do they, they don't do a damn buster, do they? Do they? No, not at that scale. I don't think at 48. I don't think they do. Um, I think everybody thinks it's a bit odd. So I don't know why they didn't bring one out. If you want a downbuster at 48 scale, this is the one I'd go for. 9 out of 10! You might say I'm being generous, but it's the King's coronation! God save the King! I'm British! I am British! Look, I've even got my British Union flag on my tie. I've got many, many Union flags on my tie. Anyway, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the review. Cheers to all of you. <coughs> As I said to our American friends, I've removed your flag. <laughs> don't worry, it's coming right back very soon. I've removed all the other flags apart from the British one. But don't worry, our national jingoism will soon abate and we'll go back to normal service. And we'll try and bring in as many countries as we can. Uh, oh, certainly of the major countries. Oh, Australia was the other one. Australia and New Zealand, I forgot. Those are the flags I think I've got on order as well. So you Aussies and Kiwis, we're going to bring you into this as well and try on as many flags as is sensible because we have a lot of supporters in that watch the channel in New Zealand and Australia. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the, the review. It's kind of come out where I thought it was. I, I thought it was going to be about an eight and a half out of ten, but there are, for the money, there, there's quite a few extras in that kit that sort of help to get it up the ladder, perhaps half a point or a point more than maybe they've expected. I thought it was going to be eight, eight and a half. I don't think nine is unreasonable if you can pick it up for £85. I think that's quite a, a lot of plastic, a lot of kit. Nice instructions, it's all very clear and it'll be a fairly straightforward build. So, what's not to like? Anyway, thank you very much for joining me. Please come and see the Dam Busters historical talk I'm going to do because I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. I'm not going to bore people with stuff they already know. I'm just going to have a fairly relaxed discussion about the film, about the raids themselves and show you this book that I've got, which is a very interesting one, some great photographs in it. One or two photos you might not have seen before. We're going to go through that and I hope you'll enjoy that and uh, I think it'd be nice to celebrate and recognise the sacrifice and the achievement of what was done and the technical achievement you know, from Barnes Wallace, a quite remarkable uh, man, it has to be said. We'll talk about that and we will uh, commemorate this, uh, the raids on the, uh, the Ruhr Dams in May 1943. We'll talk about all that. I hope you'll find it interesting. In the meantime, till next time, thank you very much for joining me. Very nice for you to come along and take the trouble to watch my videos. I do appreciate it. And please do comment. Give us a like. Give us a 10 out of 10 with a thumbs up. Uh, and, you know, come in the chat. Do whatever you like and make sure you, you keep up to speed. 
by dinging the notification bell so you get told about the next video that's coming up. Until next time then, please all look after yourselves. Hope you enjoyed the coronation weekend and I will see you again very, very soon. Until then, cheers. Mm. God save the king. God save my YouTube subscribers. <laughs> Thanks very much to all of you. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.